couple of exception or one exception. Things improved to such an extent in Latin America that when the global financial crisis hit in the mid five to six years ago in the mid 2000s, Latin Americans were quick to point out that they, for one, didn't cause this international crisis, and two, were well suited or well positioned to survive the shocks of that global crisis. Um, now, why they were able to survive and uh, even prosper uh, some of those countries, including Brazil and others, during this global financial crisis is obviously a very complex story that we can't get to all the factors now. But there's no question that one of the factors contributing to Latin America's ability to su uh, survive and even uh, do well during this crisis was its ties, increasing ties to China. China has increasingly over the decades become a bigger investor in the region. In 1990, the investment levels were about $10 billion. I mean, in 2000, they were about $10 billion. By 2009, they'd gone up to $100 billion. And in 2011, investment was close to over $245 billion. So there's no question that China's investment interest Engage in, engagement with Latin America was a factor in helping the region survive and overcome um, some of the worst parts of that global financial crisis. And ch China, not only did Latin America sell more to China as a result, they also purchased more and received uh, uh, more investments in uh, several sectors of the economy, in infrastructure, uh, and so on. So the relationship over the last decade or so has increased dramatically. Uh, it's also diversified. What was only or primarily an economic relationship has become more complex and at times obviously more controversial uh, as questions about uh, uh, resource extraction uh, environmental impact, sustainability also come onto the uh, agenda. So the presence of Latin America, uh, in Latin America of China has been both positive and raised some important questions. What is the interest of China in Latin America? What will be its long-term impact on the people there? And for the United States, of course, a lot of interesting questions about what is China's intention, and how should the U.S. understand that increasing presence in the region. Obviously, it's also important uh, and of interest to us to understand how Latin Americans themselves see this changing and evolving relationship. And so <coughs> we are delighted to be joined today <coughs> by uh, 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 the Vanderbilt University's Latin America Public Opinion Project that included a series of questions on this issue and its, its uh, survey uh, for the first time, I believe, uh, uh, just this, this last round of surveys, where we begin to understand or maybe set a bit of a baseline uh, amongst uh, Latin Americans and their opinions about China. To help us in this process and discuss not only that, the, the results, but the implications of these surveys, we're joined by, first and foremost, a friend, um, uh, Professor Elizabeth Zeckmeister, who is uh, the Associate Professor of Political Science and the Associate Director of the L.A. Pop uh, Project at Vanderbilt University. Um, she is co-author of numerous books and articles, including Democracy at Risk, How Terrorist Threats Affect the Public, and uh, Latin America Party Systems uh, by University Press in 2010. She's going to briefly introduce the LA Pop Survey Project and the China model, um, uh, model and uh, what the, some of the main conclusions are of that uh, survey. Then she'll be followed by uh, Dina Aspuru. Uh, is a, she's the Associate Professor of Political Science at Wichita State University in Kansas. Previously, she was visiting professor of political science and research coordinator for the LA Pop Project 
at Vanderbilt University, and she'll provide us some perspective on how citizens in Latin America uh, view China and also how they view uh, the United States and some comparison and contrast between uh, views on China and the United States. Then we're especially honored this morning to be joined by Professor Liu Kang. He's the director of the Duke China Research Center in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Duke University. He's also chair, professor, and dean of the Institute of Arts and Humanities in Shanghai uh, Jiantong University in China. His current projects uh, include global surveys of China's image, Chinese soft power and public diplomacy, and political and ideological changes in China. And Dr. Kang will speak on China-Latin America relations and some commentary on the survey and survey results themselves. And last but not least, a good friend for many years, uh, uh, Dan Erickson. Daniel Erickson is the, uh, will be our discussant today. Uh, Dan is, was appointed senior advisor for policy in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the U.S. Department of State in 2010, where he serves as the lead speechwriter and advises the assistant secretary on issues related to policy and strategy, economic engagement, and multilateral affairs. And uh, in addition to his official role and, and, and what he does at the State Department, I think he is really important to bring him uh, to participate in this panel because prior to joining the State Department, uh, he worked at the Inter-American Dialogue and uh, was really one of the leading students researchers and writing, writers about China in Latin America. So I think he brings a lot of expertise to this discussion as well. We have fuller biographies uh, that you can uh, get a hold of outside, um, but I'll leave it at that and uh, invite Liz to uh, kick this off. I think what we're gonna do because of the logistics here is speakers will come here. I think others might move uh, up there and we'll just kind of rotate in and out if that's okay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for that rich um, and kind introduction. And thank you all for being here today. It's a pleasure to be back at the Wilson Center and to um, present some of this data that is essentially and, 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 and sort of figuratively, but as close to literally as possible, fresh off the presses. So this is our, our first time running through some of this, these data and these findings in a public forum. And we're you know, anxious and, and ready to hear your, your reactions and your comments and your questions. So as Eric said, we hear a good deal about China's political and economic relations in the Latin American and Caribbean region <coughs> by looking at the news, by, by looking at the various policy dialogues that are taking place in D.C. and elsewhere. But the question we wanted to ask is, what do people in Latin America and in the Caribbean think about China and its presence in the region? And so that's what we're going to try to look at today. We're going to do so by way of La Pop's America's Barometer Regional Project. This is a regional survey, and it exists thanks to a number of important uh, donors and sponsors, including USAID, Vanderbilt University. I want to thank the Tinker Foundation. Um, if you're munching on a, a muffin or um, some coffee, uh, you can thank the Tinker Foundation for that. They've been incredibly generous in supporting these types of, of uh, dissemination activities and policy dialogues over some of the findings from the America's Barometer survey project. I want to also point out on this list of, 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 of supporters that you see here, the Duke China Research Center, which was instrumental in bringing this topic to our attention and the support for moving forward with a, a series of questions that, look, that allow us to look at public opinion in the Americas toward China. The point of this next slide is to blind you with logos, um, if you were wondering. And what we want to do, what I want to do, is just acknowledge that the Latin American Public Opinion Project and the America's Barometer Survey functions out of Vanderbilt University, but exists as a consortium of partners across the Americas. These partners are crucial with respect to the development of the survey, the testing of the survey, the implementation of the survey, and the analysis of the results. And so um, while we're here today, we're here sort of uh, only on the 
shoulders of all these other people who have worked so hard to complete the project with us. Since 2004, the America's Barometer has existed, as I said, as a regional survey project dedicated to studying democratic public opinion in the Americas. We began in 2004 with a core set of countries and we expanded throughout the years so that in the past two rounds of the America's Barometer, we've covered 26 countries and over 41,000 individuals within the study. The, um, well, box that's coming up now says that and gives you a sense of the margin of error and you'll see some of this margin of error coming in when we present estimates from the survey with the confidence intervals around those estimates and I'll point those out in a minute. The America's Barometer survey project itself contains over 175,000 interviews and all of these data are available online. You can freely access, download them just by pointing, clicking your way through our website where you'll also find our, our reports on various topics and, and various years of the project. Uh, focused on countries, focused on a comparative perspective, and some special reports. And again, as I said, the data itself. And you can see here on the screen, the, the sort of screen that you'll arrive at if you go into to point and click your way through to, to access the, those data. We want to thank, again, the Tinker Foundation for helping us to make those data so easily and freely accessible to the public. The America's Barometer Regional Survey is a collection of national surveys with a common core. And these national surveys are representative, meaning that we interview individuals in their households face to face, except for in the, in the US and Canada where we, it's just cost prohibitive to do that. But in the, in the region that we're gonna talk about today, in Latin America and in the Caribbean, these are interviews in people's homes face to face. And we interview in easy to access urban areas, as you see here in this densely populated um, shot of, of urban Bolivia. And we also interview in hard to reach rural areas. So when you're looking at the data, we're giving you a portrait of the average public opinion in that country. We can break it down further and look at divides between the urban and the rural areas. And also within subregions of the country, where are the, the number of respondents that we include in each country is large enough and the sample design is complex enough that we can actually look at, at re major geographic units within the country and, and, and do analyses there. One of the things that makes us unique is that we use smartphone devices and our own software developed by our partners at the University of Costa Rica and now at, in, in uh, Cochabamba, Bolivia, who are working on our Android version of the software. We use smartphone devices to collect the data in most all countries. And what this allows us to do is to uh, reduce the amount of data entry error in the survey data set and also to customize the survey so that we can, ex we can include experimental modules, we can program in different languages within a given interview. The interviewer can, can switch languages to, to sort of uh, move the interview along with someone who is a bilingual interviewee and code switching between two languages. What you see here though on the screen is an example of our pre-testing and that's what I wanted to talk about just briefly. One, another thing that makes us unique is the way that we go about pretesting each round. We begin with a series of small pretests in a select number of countries, and by the time the survey is just about ready to go into the field, we have pretested extensively in every country in which we are working. These are pretests that are qualitative in nature. So we're not just sending out the survey and seeing sort of what happens. Um, instead, we're sending one of our staffers. Here we have one of our LAPOP team members listening in on a pretest in Guyana. And what you can see is this woman in curlers is being interviewed by this, by this um, professional interviewer in Guyana. We always use people who are from the country to, to do the interviews and they're trained by us as I'll show you in a minute. She, this woman is interviewing the woman in curlers and our staffer is standing there listening to see how the interview is going. Are the questions working? So why is that important? I wanna give you an example that's very relevant today um, but first I want to mention that what this ends up doing is, is, is giving us guidance on how we can make the questions better. How, how can we get it right? And so for the 2012 round of the America's Barometer, just to give you a sense of what this operation means, we introduced over a thousand edits to the core questionnaire as we went through this series. Sometimes we're changing a word because it doesn't work in one country. You know, there are many different types of uh, varieties of Spanish. Sometimes we're changing the structure of a question because it's too confusing and not, not clear. So here's the, the example I want to give you today. And it, at the core, this is the point. China's not Taiwan, <laughs> right? So what happened is when we started pretesting the China module that we're going to talk about today, 
we started pre-testing in Uruguay and in Peru. Those are the countries in which we generally start our pre-testing. And the China module was going fairly well. We were asking people about their attitudes toward China, and people seemed more or less to get it. Now, there's, uh, there are a number of people who don't really have opinions that they're willing to express or able to express. They, they may not have knowledge. They may be ambivalent, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But for the most part, the, the question was working. And we continued to roll out the pre-testing. And we got to the Central American countries. And our staffer, who was in Honduras, contacted us and said, we have a problem. Every time the interviewer asks the respondent about China, the person responds back, Taiwan. Let me tell you what I think about Taiwan. And we realized that we had sort of a, 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 you know, a real need to clarify what we were talking about with, with our, inter our interviewees. And so what we did was we, we sat around in, in our offices and we came up with a, a prompt that began then the, the survey module in all countries in which we clarify this for people. So this is in English what we, what we ended up with. In Spanish, we use the phrase um, continental China. But in, in here, we say mainland China. So we began the, sur the survey module uh, where we were about to ask people about China with a, with a bit of a clarification. And we introduced that in all countries so that the questionnaire is standardized across all countries. And the, the, the prompt says, now we're going to talk about your views with respect to some countries. When we talk about China in this interview, we we're talking about mainland China, the People's Republic of China, and not the island of Taiwan. And there, there might have been <coughs> other ways to do it, but that way we felt like we could be more certain that we're getting people's attitudes about China and, and not Taiwan when we present these data to you today. Even when we get it right, some people just may not have opinions about complex foreign affairs questions, and in particular, in this case, about China. And this is important to keep in mind when we look at the data today, and it's also important um, and rich information for us, because we can compare across countries, across subregions within countries, across types of people with respect to who has opinions about China in Latin America and the Caribbean region. And so here you see just one question as an example here. The question is, which of the following countries has the most influence in Latin America or the Caribbean with that phrase varied by the subregion that the individual is located in. And we had a number of different options, and I've grouped them here. So you can see that about 60% of people responded with something other than China, about 20% responded with China, and then almost an additional 20% responded that they, that they don't know, right? And so it's important to keep that in mind as, I, as we present the data to you today. On easier foreign policy questions, and I'll show you some of them, people have opinions. On complex foreign policy questions, a number of people don't have opinions. The standard non-response rate for our, our questions on our survey is about 4 to 5 percent tops. Right? So here we're, we're quadrupling that. Right? We can analyze that data, though. So who's more likely to have opinions about China when we ask sort of these harder questions, these more complex questions? Well, it, this won't surprise you. Uh, wealthier and more educated citizens are more likely to give responses. And also, we find that men are more likely to give responses. That's standard in the, in the survey uh, response and, and psychological literature is on, on responding to questionnaires. Uh, men tend to feel more comfortable guessing and offering an opinion, and women, especially when given the option, tend to be the ones who are more likely to say that they, that they don't know or they're unsure. So we can see that systematically in the data. And what I'm presenting to you here, you're going to see a couple more of these. This is a regression uh, output chart, and we've tried to make it somewhat uh, viewer friendly. These are standardized regression coefficients, these dots. These are confidence intervals, these uh, horizontal lines around the, the, the dot. They give us a sense of where that, that true value that we're estimating there is likely to fall, so that if the horizontal line crosses this zero vertical line, we can say that we're not really all that confident that that result is different from zero. But if it stands apart from that zero line, then we can be confident that we have a, a statistically significant relationship. So here we have education out here. It's in the positive uh, side of the, of the <coughs> regression chart. So the more educated one is, the more likely they are to give a response. And here we see women over here. And, the, and, the, and what we're seeing is that it, you know, if you're female, you're less likely to give a response to these questions. We can also see some systematic variation across region. And as I said, it, if you want to, you can break the data down even further and look ac across countries and subregions within countries. But let me, let me move forward. I want to give you some more of a, a sort of a richer substantive picture of what do people in the Americas think about China's presence in the region and also in their country. So I'm going to tackle those two topics, their perception of China in the region and then their perception of China in their country um, 
in the country in which they're located. So the first question is, to what extent do individuals in Latin America and the Caribbean see China as currently or evolving into a major player in the region? Right? And I've put up here some of the sort of takeaway key points, but I'm going to walk through them in a series of slides. I think that qualitatively, we could sum up the answer to this question um, as sort of in terms of uh, to what extent do, do citizens in the Americas think of China as a major player? Somewhat. Okay? That's the qualitative takeaway message, but let me, let me show you a little bit more detail here. So we first asked respondents to single out the most influential country in the region from their perspective, which country, we gave them a list, we allowed them to offer another option off of the, that wasn't on the list, which country is the most influential country in either Latin America or the Caribbean with that phrase varying depending on where the person is located. And when we take the regional, sur the average for the America's Barometer Survey, we find that one out of every five individuals who is interviewed responds that China is the most influential country in the region. So as I said, somewhat, right? So somewhat uh, important, somewhat, somewhat influential. And we also see significant cross-national variation. So at the top, and I want to point this out because you're going to see these countries toward the top again and again, we see Costa Rica, Venezuela, Guyana, Jamaica's here, but you're going to see it, it, it pop up a number of additional times. And, um, and, uh, and interestingly enough, Nicaragua down here, but I'm going to come back to that. Okay? We then asked individuals to look forward and tell us in 10 years which country, as you see here, will, will have the most influence, will be most influential in the Latin American or Caribbean region. And here the graph has some similarities to the last graph. So again, the mean is somewhat similar, the average nearly, in this case, nearly uh, one quarter of citizens who were interviewed responded that China will soon be the most influential country in the region, so not that different from people's current assessment. And if we look at the countries that are at the top, we see similar countries at the top, Costa Rica, Jamaica, Guyana, Venezuela, um, and Nicaragua has moved up just, a, just a, t a touch there from the bottom position. Next, we wanted to look at how positively or negatively individuals assess this influence to be. So one question is, you know, how, how relevant is China? Another question is, how, you know, what's your assessment of that, of that influence? And so we asked individuals, thinking about China and the influence that it has in the region, is it very positive? positive, negative, or negative. And what we've done here is we've rescaled this, this question um, to run from a 0 to 100 scale where higher values are more positive. So when you look across this axis down here, it goes from 0, which would be the most negative answer that someone could give, and positive, which is actually out here, sort of off the, off the charts because we're not quite there yet. We're excluding the 2% the who said that, they, that, there was, that such a China had sort of no influence, and also non-respondents from this, from, from this set of answers here. What you can see is that this are average evaluations within each country range from neutral to, to sort of relatively positive. So again, it kind of gets me back to that qualitative uh, answer that I gave you before of sort of somewhat, somewhat positive, right? And there's still, again, variation across countries. Um, one of the interesting things that some of you have probably already noted here is that now Nicaragua has jumped up to the top. Right? So whereas Nicaraguans don't see China to be all that influential in the region, to the extent that it is in the region, they view it as, as, as positive, along with uh, individuals in Venezuela, Costa Rica, uh, Panama, and Guyana, some of those countries that we were seeing up in that range on the previous slides. So that, what that tells us is that whereas Nicaragua is moving, the rest of the ordering is staying relatively sort of constant or similar, suggests that where China is perceived to be more influential, it's also perceived to be more positive in terms of that influence with that exception of Nicaragua. But now when we ask people to, 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 when we look at comparisons, right, between how people perceive China's influence in the region and other countries, we see that China's influence is, you know, on average, somewhat positive in terms of people's perceptions, but it trails somewhat people's perceptions of, J of Japan's influence in the region and also Brazil's influence in the region. It just, again, somewhat trails, right? So it's so it's not it's not like we're walking off a cliff here, but but there's a there's a slight difference in terms of average perceptions of the quality of the influence that these countries have in the region. So I want to now just briefly talk about people's perceptions of China's influence in their own country, right? 
And again, um, I want to sort of get the, sort of the, the message across that the evaluations are sort of, you know, warm, but not overwhelmingly warm, and, and, and certainly not in the, in the negative range. Let me, let me move to this slide. So on average, when we ask people about how much influence China has in their own country, and here the response <coughs> options differ slightly, so we're again looking at on, on here on a zero to 100 scale, but the response options behind that scale are slightly different, we're still ending up in the same type of range, right? On average, individuals in the Latin American and Caribbean region view China to have some influence in, in the region. We also asked whether or not individuals thought that relations between their country and China were growing closer or more distant, and we asked that question with respect to a number of other countries as well, so we could look at this in comparative perspective. Now here we've rescaled things to run from negative 50 to 50, so that you can sort of see in the negative range would be re mean responses that, are, that tend toward a more distant uh, projection, and positive uh, values indicating that, that individuals are, are projecting that the two countries, their country and either China here or the U.S. will grow closer. And so what you see is that people do see that, that the sort of future holds a stronger relationship with, with China than they currently have. And they also see at the same time that relationships with, their relationship with the U.S. continuing to, to grow. On the other hand, we can contrast that with what they are thinking when they look at Russia, uh, Iran, and Israel, and there they see the relationship between their country and those countries each growing more distant. Again, the question though is, what do they think of this, uh, of, of this set of, of circumstances and China's influence in their country? Do they think of this positively or negatively? So in this case, we asked them about their evaluation of China's influence in their own country. And again, we see that on average, responses are in the positive range. And what we've done here with this pie chart is that we have taken people who responded either positive or very positive and grouped them here together. And 63% of individuals respond with one of those two options, that, that the influence is either positive or very positive. But again, there's important variation across countries. So now we've taken that same question and the responses to it and put it back on our zero to 100 scale. So these now are not percentages, they're mean values on the scale. And we can see again that there's, that there's significant variation. And again, the, the, the variation that we see, the lineup, the roster of countries is, is similar to the lineup that we saw when we looked at the region. So again, Jamaica, Venezuela, Costa Rica are at the top. And, and in this case, Mexico is, is, is at the bottom in terms of assessments of China's influence in the individual's country. But all of the countries are over what we might call the sort of 50 unit midpoint on that zero to 100 scale. So they're all sort of trending or, or <coughs> tending toward the positive side of things. We also asked a, a number of additional questions about Chinese businesses. And we're not gonna get into detail uh, with respect to these questions today, but I want you to know that they're available and just, just gives you a sense of one of these. We asked about evaluations of Chinese business in the country. And the, the results here, again, mirror what you've seen before with Jamaica, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic um, at the top and, and Mexico down at the bottom. Finally, for, for the section that I want to present, we also asked individuals in the Americas whether or not they thought that China was the, the model that their country should be <coughs> following for development. And we offered people the option of selecting China among, among others. And what we find is that only 16% of citizens across the Americas select China as the country that, that their own country should be modeling when it comes to development. So whereas evaluations on average are moderately positive toward China, whereas people perceive China's influence to be moderately strong and growing, only 16% of individuals that were surveyed respond that China should be the model for, for their own country's development. Again, though, significant variation across country, and we'll be interested to see, across countries, we'll be interested to see whether or not this changes over time. So I'm gonna turn things over now to Denora, who's gonna offer some assessment of China and public opinion toward China in Latin America and the Caribbean in comparative perspective. I was just going to make an announcement. Uh, for those of you who are battling the column back there and are having trouble seeing, there are a few scattered empty seats up here in front. Um, so if you, you want to move on over, um, please do.
Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for, uh, to the Wilson Center, um, you know, for having us here and uh, allowing us to present some of our findings. Uh, my um, my expertise is not on China. I don't do much on Latin America and China, but I do uh, have done uh, work on Latin America, on the U.S. and Latin America. Therefore, I was asked to do a comparison of, you know, what is the influence of uh, China in comparison with the influence that Amer the Latin American and the Caribbean is. Uh, with regards to the U.S., as we all know, you know the U.S. has been the dominant actor in the region for you know forever, and uh, so it's interesting to see another you know um, important country, you know in terms especially of the, the second largest economy in the world right now, uh, coming into the region. You know what impact is it going to have on the relations with the traditional actor in the region? Um, here we see. Let's see. Uh, like, I'm not going to go through the first, through the same question, uh, same, um, you know, issues that Liz went, but I'm going to do it in a, in a comparative perspective. Uh, here we see the compa uh, comparing the perception of influence. Uh, we find, uh, you know, which country has the most influence in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we see that uh, in 2012, I'm sorry, the United States still had, uh, you know, 40 percent of the people thought that the United States was the country that had the most influence, compared to 20 percent that uh, thought about China as having the most influence. Uh, in some of the work I've done with regards to the U.S., I found out that there is an important um, difference in countries that are part of the ALBA group. For those of you that don't know uh, what ALBA is, ALBA is a group of countries that um, got together. It's an organization formed by uh, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, Nicaragua, and Cuba, and uh, that was formed under the let's say, influence of Hugo Chavez. When, you know, he was one of his you know, um, organizations that he really promoted. And uh, it's been an organization that has taken on several actions, uh, particularly with regards to the U.S. You know, ALBA as a group decided that they were going to uh, expel the U.S. Uh, AID from their countries, you know, that they were no longer going to allow them to work in there. As an extreme measure of, you know, one of the things like, uh, hey, we don't want, of course, uh, the, the U.S. to be in our, in our countries. Now, we don't know whether they're going to continue in that direction now that uh, Hugo Chavez is gone, but certainly at that time, you know, that was one of the main ideas. And on the other hand, they have, you know, Venezuela in particular, they have made strides to, you know, enlarge their, their pool of uh, international contacts, and certainly China has been one of the actors that has been uh, coming strong into this uh, group of ALBA countries. So uh, when we look at the ALBA countries, hold on, sorry, uh, we see that actually um, there is a difference, whereas in uh, the rest of the countries that are not ALBA, uh, 19 percent, uh, 44% think that the U.S. is the most influential actor. In ALBA countries, only 26% of the people think that the U.S. is the most influential act, uh, actor. With regards to China, there is not much difference, 20% in the non-ALBA and 20 in the ALBA countries, but there is uh, a difference um, in, in there. Now, with regards to assessing the type of influence, uh, we have the, um, and actually this wasn't my last uh, PowerPoint. I don't know if you have another one, Liz, because this wasn't my last slide. Uh, what's that? Okay, I, I don't know, I can't remember, okay. Anyway, because we were changing PowerPoints and at the end we, this wasn't the last one. But anyway, this shows the perception for the 24 countries and uh, we see that the influence of China is 51% uh, uh, of the people think that it's positive and 16% think that it's uh, very positive. Altogether, we find that uh, in the, with regards to China, 68% of uh, Latin American and Caribbean citizens actually think that uh, you know, the, the influence of China is positive. When we compare it to the United States, we find that 62% of people in the, in the region think that it's positive. So somehow, okay, we still think that the U.S., you know, in Latin America, think that the U.S. is most influential, but when it comes to whether it is a positive influence, actually, China, uh, you know, outgrows the United States by a few points in the region as a whole. And this becomes even more specific uh, when we look at the ALBA countries. In the ALBA countries, uh, we have that 67% uh, uh, percent of the people actually consider that China's influence is uh, positive, whereas I'm sorry. Whereas in the case of the United States, only 54% of the people in the ALBA countries consider that the United States has a positive influence. So we see a, a difference here in terms of, okay, we know that these countries have influence, but China tends to be seen as a more positive influence uh, all across the region, but in particular in the ALBA countries. 
And uh, with regards to the negative influence, there is also a change in, uh, in terms of China. In the ALBA countries, 12% only of the people think that China has a negative influence, whereas 21% uh, of people in the ALBA countries think that uh, the United States has a negative influence. Okay, uh, with regards to what uh, Liz already mentioned, you know, the future influence. Uh, we, they were asked, you know, within 10 years, which country will have the most influence? And we see a, a trend here. Uh, the United States uh, has come down from 40%, uh, you know, currently to actually 30%. And China has gone up, as, China, as uh, Liz mentioned, to 23%. And the other countries is 46%. So even though the influence of China, we don't see it as growing, apparently citizens in the area do see the United States as decreasing in terms of the influence that it's going to have in the countries. Uh, it's by 10 percent point, you know, which is a lot to say in a region that maybe if you ask this question 10, 15 years ago, everybody would have said, oh, the U.S. is going to still be always the most influential actor. So there is something that is interesting that seems to be changing there. Now, um, there is the question of the role models that I call the role models for development, which is very interesting. So as Neil Lee's mentioned, only 16 percent of the people see China as a role model. Uh, do we see, you know, do people see the United States? And not necessarily. 27% of the people uh, still see the United States as the role model in 2012. And uh, this is the breakdown of the rest of the countries. 12% um, see Japan as a model, 7% as Brazil, 2% as, uh, you know, Venezuela being the role model, 1% Mexico, 1% Singapore, 0.8 Russia, 0.7 uh, India and South Korea. But a lot of the people, about 10% said that they should follow their own model, and about 18% of the people really didn't have an answer. So it's interesting, because if we think like, oh, you know, the people in the region either want the free market model of the US or, you know, or the China model, but people are still not really much, you know, into that uh, framework of who should we choose. You know, it's a lot of people really want to look for their own model. Okay, and again, when we go to the ALBA countries, which are the ones that, you know, that I particularly highlighting here, we see that there is a difference. Uh, in Venezuela, is the only country uh, in which China surpasses the U.S. as a role model. About 25% of the people in Venezuela said that China should be a role model, which is a very interesting, uh, you know, um, finding. And you wonder what's going to happen in the post-Chavez era, you know, is this going to continue being the case or not? But you're talking about a quarter of the population that sees China, okay, that's something that we could do, go forward. Now, um, in the other ALBA countries, Ecuador, 18% of the people see uh, China as a role model, Bolivia, 13, and Nicaragua, 12. So all these, these two are under the, the regional average. <coughs> now, do you see the United States as a role model? Uh, we see that Nicaragua, actually, still 26% of the people see, uh, see the U.S. as a role model, 24% of the people in Ecuador, 15% on Bolivia, and this is interesting, only 12% of the people in Venezuela see the U.S. as a role model. So there is obviously a very, you know, stark difference in between those, uh, those countries. Okay. Now we go to a different topic, which is uh, the trust in the country. Uh, in political science, we put a lot of emphasis in the world in the word trust, if you ever heard of Robert Putnam, you know, he came up with these issues that people, it's very important to measure what is the trust that people feel, more than the opinion, you know, how much do they trust an institution, et cetera. So in this case, we asked about trust in, you know, in different countries, and in particular, the US and China. And we see that um, that varies a lot. Uh, the countries that I marked in dark in here are the ALBA countries. And uh, we see that uh, the trust overall in, uh, in China tends to be lower. This is the 50 point percent line. So it tends to be a little lower overall in China than in the US. And this graph is hard to read, so I'll, I'll move on to the one that has more detail. Uh, in this one, again, we see the trust compared between uh, you know, the ALBA and the non-ALBA countries. Among the ALBA countries, we see that 51, uh, the average is 51 points you know, for tr of trust in China in the 0, 100 scale. And the average trust in the U.S. is 43. And in the other countries, it's interesting to see Russia has 37. Uh, <coughs> Iran, Iran and, Isra and Israel actually have similar levels of trust, 28 points. And in the non-ALBA countries, it is, you know, the U.S. and China kind of flip around. Uh, the average trust in the U.S. is actually uh, greater in the non-ALBA countries with 56 points and China with 49 points. 
and the other countries are very similar, you know, to the ALBA countries. So we see, okay, in these ALBA countries, apparently the, the perception of China is very much, you know, uh, uh, enlarged and, you know, and the trust in China is greater than, than it is in the other countries that are not part of the ALBA group. Uh, that doesn't happen with regards to the uh, influence, uh, to the trust in Russia or I Iran, which is an interesting case, but it happens with regards to the trust uh, in China. And in fact, China and the United States are the only countries that obtain uh, averages higher than 40 points in our scale. So that is an important finding. Now, uh, this one uh, tells us something uh, with regards to which countries actually trust the U.S. more than China, uh, still, you know, in 2012. And we see that countries in Central America and the Caribbean tend to have much greater, and I found this in all the, re all the uh, research I've done, they have a much more positive opinion of the U.S. than they do in South America. So countries that are nearby, except for Mexico, you know, are, tend to be much more, uh, you know, supportive of the U.S. And it's no surprise here that the countries that have the higher levels of trust in, uh, in the U.S. are Haiti, El Salvador, Suriname, the Dominican Republic, Guyana. Brazil actually has a relatively high level of trust. But still, as of 2012, all these countries still trusted the U.S. more than they trusted China. We'll see if this changes. It's important to do this, you know, baseline study, you know, repeat it in five years, see if it has changed. But already in 2012, there were four countries that uh, have higher le levels of trust in China than in the U.S. And those countries are Venezuela, which is no surprise, but also Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile, which are not part of the, the, the last three are not part of the ALBA group. So it is interesting to see how this, uh, you know, changes uh, across the region. Now, one thing that Liz explained, and it's very complex usually to understand, so hopefully, uh, you know, I'll, I'll re-explain it again. We, in in our work, we try to not only go, to go beyond the, the descriptive uh, data and to go beyond the percentages and what percent of the people think this or think that, we actually try to find out the why reason. You know, why is there, you know, some kind of a, uh, of, of a result? And for this, we do regression analysis, which leads us, uh, you know, to, to find out what are the factors that are associated with a certain behavior or a certain opinion about things. <coughs> and these charts here actually put it in a very graphic way. We wanted to know uh, whether people, uh, you know, who thought, you know, who had higher trust in China, what were the, the, the factors that influenced that, and same thing for the United States. And we use in the model different things. Ideology, whether people who have a certain ideology are more likely to, to trust China or the U.S., whether paying attention to the news has an influence, uh, whether approving the president of the country uh, has an influence, whether the, the wealth of that they have has an influence being a man or a woman, and the age and the educational level. And we find very interesting things. We find that in the case of ideology, if we go one by one, ideology plays no role whatsoever in the opinion on the trust that people have about China. You know, doesn't seem to be an issue. Whereas in the case of the U.S., people who self-identify as, as being on the right, more to the right of the political spectrum, in a, we use a one to 10 scale in which uh, 10 is, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten is being to the right. We see that people who are trust, uh, who have more trust in the United States, tend to be to the right of the political spectrum. We're going to get back because I have another chart on this. Uh, in both cases, people who pay attention to the news are more likely to trust both the United States and, and uh, China, uh, which is probably no surprise. You know that people are more aware of what they are. Now, this one is very interesting, and I have found it in other research I've done. The approval of the pres of the president of the country's performance is related to the approval of China or to the trust in China. Uh, I think this is influenced a lot by the, um, by the countries of ALBA and other countries in which the president has a, you know, a very uh, open uh, relation with China, visits China, and even in the case of Brazil, you know, they have the presidents themselves promote the idea of getting closer to China. So apparently people who do, you know, have a higher approval rate of their president in <coughs> Latin America, they also tend to trust China more, which doesn't play a role whatsoever in the case of the U.S. So in the case of the U.S., it doesn't matter what the president says, you know, that really doesn't influence the trust of the people, whereas it influences it in the case of, uh, of China. The wealth is also interesting. In the case of China, wealth doesn't play any role whatsoever in explaining trust in China. But it does explain, explaining, uh, it does ex 
uh, explain a trust in the US. People who tend to be wealthier are more likely to have uh, higher levels of trust in the US. Uh, in the case of women, that's a uh, you know, bad sign in both sides. And if, it is, if, if there is a poli policy prescription, maybe for China this would be it, and also for the US. In both countries, uh, we're going to see a slide on this, women are less, you know, they trust the US and China less than men. So for some reason, we, have, we don't trust <laughs> the US and China. Uh, let's see. Uh, lastly, or oh, no, not lastly, but age doesn't have any influence. Apparently, whether you are 18 or whether you are 50, you know, it doesn't really drive your trust in China or the U.S. But education here, uh, you know, does play a large role. It, the people with higher levels of education are more likely or prone to trust in China, uh, in Latin America, whereas education doesn't really play a role in the case of the U.S. You know, so those are interesting findings, and we can see them here a little more clearly. Uh, with regards to the president approval, people who have a, a very bad opinion of the, um, of the president actually have lower levels of trust in China, only 31 points of trust, whereas people who have a very good opinion of the performance of their president, act, uh, for instance, uh, in good and very good, uh, they have 43 points of trust in China. So there is a very, what we call in a statistics, a very linear relationship. You know, people who have higher trust in their president also tend to have higher trust in China. Now, people who are in the field, you know, who are policymakers, they probably can explain this better, but this is a finding that we have. And in the case of ideology, there is a very clear linear relationship as well. People in the left, well, maybe that's not a surprise, are less likely to trust the United States Whereas as you move more to the right in the political spectrum, especially when you get to the eight and nine, if you say, you know, in this political spectrum, what do you consider yourself? If you say, oh, I am an eight, you know, I'm very much to the right or nine points, you are much more likely to trust the United States. And in case of women, here is, uh, you know, what I told you about the, the interesting part. In both countries, uh, China and the United States, men uh, are more, Trust board, you know, have more trust in the in China and have more trust in the United States. Trust in uh, among men is 41 points, you know, in China and 51 points for the U.S. And women 34 for China and 47 for for the U.S. So still, in both cases, the United States generates a higher level of trust, or you know, uh, but women in both cases have lower lower levels. So I think that's all with regards with my, to my presentation, and I let the discussants and you know do their their part of interpreting you know what all these results mean. Okay, thank you. Um, well, it's a, it's a great honor to be here. I really want to thank uh, the Wilson Center uh, to invite us to talk about this uh, very, very interesting, I think very rich data. Um, and uh, I'm particularly honored uh, to know that uh, Ambassador Stapleton is uh, here present. So I'm looking forward to more uh, constructive conversations with the audience. Um, <coughs> the uh, uh, our uh, host already uh, introduced uh, uh, the uh, the survey project that uh, uh, we have conducted. Um, just uh, let me take this opportunity to uh, uh, have a little more uh, advertising. Uh, we uh, at the Shanghai Jiao Tong University and Duke University uh, start to. Uh, uh, conduct uh, this uh, global survey of the uh, uh, the perception that an, an image of China uh, three years ago. Uh, uh, we've done a survey of the U.S. public opinion on China, and uh, we completed the, the survey uh, of uh, uh, 13 Asian countries and the regions uh, about the perception of the rising China. Um, and uh, tomorrow, actually, uh, we're going to have uh, another workshop uh, uh, nearby in Brookings Institute on the uh, on our uh, uh, survey data uh, similar to this one uh, 
uh, we have a, a roughly the same schedule, you know, starting like uh, at 9 o'clock. So if uh, any of you are interested, uh, uh, please feel free to join us at Brookings Institute, not too far from here, um, on our uh, uh, data on the uh, Asian uh, countries and also the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, uh, make uh, uh, draw some uh, comparison, some analogy with regard to our Asian service, because we have the similar design, ask the same kind of questions, you know, about uh, uh, the perception, you know, positive influence and uh, negative influence and so on, especially uh, with regard, a very interesting point is the, the, the China model, whether China will serve as the model for development. We have a very interesting, uh, very, very, very big contrast between the, uh, uh, the uh, response uh, from the Asian countries, uh, 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 you know, uh, compared to the Latin American countries. Okay, uh, let me just start with a little anecdote. This is, uh, of course, uh, China's uh, President Xi Jinping when he was Vice President uh, uh, several years ago visiting uh, uh, Mexico. He was talking to a bunch of Chinese, not talking to this Mexican host, uh, you know, in a very plain uh, Chinese, uh, uh, very plain language. He says, uh, China exports no, neither revolution nor hunger and poverty and never inflicts pains on others. How come some prickly foreigners always like to meddle in, in our own business? This is my translation. If you read Chinese, uh, his Chinese is more vivid. He says something like, uh, uh, Literally, uh, uh, foreigners who uh, uh, have eaten too much without doing nothing. Uh, always uh, uh, pointing, us, uh, uh, pointing at us. Uh, and uh, we never export revolution. We never export Secondly, we never export hunger and uh, uh, poverty. Uh, that's also very kind of like a Chinese slang. Meaning uh, something we never try to bother you or try to, try to harass you or something. Uh, 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 how can you still uh, try to find trouble with us? So that's, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe that's a kind of a cautionary tale, you know, to start with uh, China's relationship with Latin American. Uh, Except that uh, you know, Xi Jinping didn't really talk about the uh, China Latin American relationship. It's within that context. You know, when he visited the Mexico, uh, you know, he was talking about the, you know how China should deal with the foreigners, so to speak. Um, some some uh, historical backgrounds, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a way to uh, uh, look at the China Latin American relationship. Uh, I would tend to think that uh, China's Latin American policy. Uh, it's um, that of a distance, caution, and gradual expansion, if you look at the history of uh, uh, China Latin American relationship. Uh, in fact, uh, the uh, only uh, China uh, had this uh, diplomatic relationship uh, was the first Latin American country uh, in, uh, with Cuba in 1960. Uh, before that, uh, China had nothing to do with uh, uh, Latin America uh, as a whole. Well, you know, in general, China uh, had a uh, uh, pretty rough time with uh, Latin American countries. Uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, in the first uh, uh, decades or so uh, after the PRC was established. Uh, we're going to get to that point later on because uh, for one thing that uh, Latin America was always considered the backyard of the United States, um, for another, uh, Latin American countries, most Latin American countries uh, used to be stru uh, staunch supporters of uh, uh, the U.S. ally and uh, the PRC uh, arch enemy, i.e. Taiwan, you know, uh, or at that point, it's called a Repub Republic of China representing uh, China's legal status in the United Nations. Um, of course, uh, 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 that, that was the true, that, that, that was true to, uh, late 1970s when uh, 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 Latin American countries uh, like uh, Mexico, uh, Brazil, and Argentina start to um, give up their relationship with Taiwan 
in uh, setting up uh, diplomatic ties with China. Okay, overall, China uh, insisted on its non-interference policy, foreign policy, uh, as uh, its uh, uh, principal uh, guidelines. And of course, uh, somehow China, uh, for uh, decades, have kept that uh, guideline uh, in its relationship, uh, relationship with uh, Latin American countries. <coughs> um, so uh, uh, for um, at least uh, till uh, quite recently, till the last uh, 20 years or so, China, re uh, China's relationship with uh, Latin American uh, countries uh, was that of a distance and caution. And uh, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, uh, in the last uh, 30 years or so uh, since the reform and opening up, uh, China started to uh, expand uh, quite rapidly globally uh, in terms of trade relationship, uh, especially with uh, Latin American countries. China's ties with Central and South uh, uh, America are really anchored in trade and driven by an insatiable hunger for natural resources. Trade between China and Latin America, uh, Latin America increased by 1,200% uh, or from uh, 10 uh, to uh, 130 billion US dollars between uh, the year 2000 and 2009. So that was an enormous uh, jump uh, in terms of the trade uh, volumes. Uh, in 2007, China's top 10 trade partners in the region were Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Argentina, Peru, Venezuela, Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Cuba. Uh, I think you know this may explain some of the, you know, uh, public opinion findings, uh, uh, you know, whether favorable or uh, unfavorable, um, in uh, uh, those uh, in our survey. However, the uh, uh, Latin American countries, uh, uh, you know, have also stepped up its. Uh, uh, you know, relationship, it's recognition of China. You know, as uh, we can see, you know, gradually uh, more Latin American countries, I think China's influence, uh, you know, it's growing and it's getting bigger in Latin American countries. Um, the, uh, uh, we have a, uh, a leading China scholar uh, in the US uh, making the assessment of China's Latin American uh, Progress Latin American uh, policy. Uh, David Shambaugh, uh, who teaches at uh, Wash uh, George Washington University and also with the uh, Brookings Institute. Uh, one of his points, uh, you know, I think is uh, quite relevant to uh, the survey data here. Uh, it's highlighted in the red, you know, uh, economic interaction is growing between China and, of course, Latin American countries. Uh, but not the region's knowledge about China. Uh, I think uh, this uh, uh, really somehow explains, uh, you know, uh, some of the data that, you know, some of the uh, assessments of China's positive influence, lack of influence in uh, sometimes a contradictory, I, I feel, uh, in, in, in terms of the, you know, uh, public opinion reactions in Latin American countries. Uh, uh, showing a certain lack of understanding, I, I believe, uh, of uh, a real China, you know, what a real China is, uh, because of all those distances. Um, you know, here are some of the uh, preliminary uh, reflections on the survey data. Um, first of all, given the historical and ge geopolitical distance between China and Latin America, uh, China's growing influence in the region is quite significant. Uh, the data shows a clear awareness of such influence with generally positive attitudes. Um, um, we have uh, made uh, you know similar uh, surveys in uh, in other you know in Asia. You know uh, uh, the uh, the reaction in Asia uh, countries and the regions are very much mixed, uh, whereas uh, the reaction in in general in Latin America towards China, uh, the attitudes towards China is much more positive. Uh, much less mixed than uh, most, uh, you know, uh, Asian countries. So that's something, you know, I find it very interesting. Um, 
more positive views of China's influence than the U.S. That's also quite uh, interesting. Uh, something like 68% uh, of uh, positive uh, on China and 62 on the U.S., something like that. Uh, it may suggest uh, China's overall performance to a lot of American countries as a modernizing country or formerly a third world a developing country uh, which is significant to Latin American public concern about their own modernization. So there's a factor probably uh, concerning uh, the uh, different uh, models or different uh, ways of uh, modernization. You know, uh, Latin American countries uh, tend uh, for for a long period of time um, sort of uh, uh, wavered between kind of U.S. Uh, model or whatever the Latin American uh, model. You know, we, we're going to get to that point uh, later on. And uh, uh, sometimes they find uh, very difficult to accept, uh, you know, this uh, status quo, you know, the lack of development or underdevelopment. Uh, so China may serve as uh, an alternative, possibly, um, in terms of its economic achievement. Uh, I think some of the data may show that uh, because uh, the, uh, the respondents in uh, Latin American countries uh, don't seem to uh, care too much about ideology or politics as much about the, you know, their performance, their leadership uh, capabilities, and so on. Uh, so that may sort of somehow indicate uh, a, uh, a, a strong curiosity in China as a, a development model. And uh, uh, what about China? China's pragmatic and non-conflictual diplomacy, or non-interference diplomacy, uh, uh, works effectively in Latin America compared to its role in other regions, particularly neighboring Asian Pacific region. You know, we, we, if we compare the data here with uh, uh, that of uh, Asian countries, uh, you know, uh, it'd be very striking, you know, see the differences. Uh, the neighboring, especially the countries that are closer to China, like Japan, of course, uh, Mongolia, and to some, uh, to some degree, Vietnam, um, have a very, very negative view about China. Uh, you know, they, uh, they all acknowledge the strong influence. I think some, somehow the, the, uh, the ratio is kind of reversed. Uh, most Asian countries acknowledge China uh, has the strongest influence in the region. Um, Whereas those countries think that China has the most powerful influence in the region in Asia, uh, tend to have rather negative views about the, the nature of the influence. Whereas those countries like the Philippines uh, believe that the United States uh, has a stronger influence uh, than China in Asia Pacific, tend to believe that China's influence in that region is more positive than negative. So this kind of interesting comparison. Uh, uh, the reason we say that China's pragmatic diplomacy works better in uh, Latin American party because, you know, there's a really uh, lack of contact, you know, it's kind of geopolitical contact and, you know, regional strategic contact, you know, so there's a distance. I think the distance factor may really explain why, you know, there's such a more positive views uh, concerning China. <coughs> uh, moreover, China's expansion in the... Uh, um, uh, Africa, and of course, you know, Africa now, right, it's on, very much on the spotlight. Uh, our uh, African survey, by the way, is uh, uh, still in the preliminary stage. It's already in the fields. So it'll be very interesting, maybe next year when we come back uh, again to compare, you know, this data, Africa, Latin America, and Asia, you know, uh, see how, uh, you know, they, they react to those things. Um, and Middle East and have been much more controversial than in Latin America. And of course, it can uh, be inferred from this public opinion survey in comparison with uh, the evidence of China's perception in other regions. Um, okay. S uh, surprisingly, uh, China only trails the US as the role model for Latin America development, overtaking Japan, Brazil, and its own. Uh, you know, uh, I guess you noticed uh, the the, uh, uh, the statistics that uh, you know the United States uh, served as a model, you know, for development. It's about 27 percent, 
In China, it's like uh, roughly like 17, 16 percent, and uh, that's really surprising, you know, because um, our data showed uh, in Asian uh, countries, uh, very few Asian uh, public opinion consider China a role model, not even the Chinese. <laughs> it's extremely frustrating for the Chinese to think. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it's just impossible to believe that. But uh, you know, roughly like 10% of the Chinese surveyed, uh, maybe 20 or 20%. Yeah, 20% of the Chinese surveyed believe China, China's own model, you know, should be a model for development. Whereas over six, uh, over 46% of the Chinese believe that the United States should serve as the role model for development for China. So this is kind of very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> now you look at this figure, you know, so it's very interesting. I don't know where to get this, but my hunch is uh, it may not have to do with uh, the ideology. Uh, it may have a lot to do with China's economic performance, very, uh, uh, very shining performance uh, without getting close. You know, if you come close to look at the what really has cost, you know, this uh, econ economic development at the expense of natural, uh, uh, natural resources, environmental issues, and uh, the equality, and so on and so forth. You may have a different uh, look. Uh, again, uh, uh, as I suggest, the trust rate for China is also quite impressive and probably a, a strong indica uh, indication of a strong popular sentiment for alternative models of development rather than the so-called Brazil, Mexico, kind of pro-US free market liberal model. Uh, we have talked a lot about, uh, about this uh, Latin American dependency uh, model or dependency theory. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, last week when I brought this issue up at the uh, China Forum in Shanghai, it's a major forum uh, in, in China. Every year they have this major forum. Um, one of the keynote speakers, Dos Santos, uh, who represent the major uh, dependency theory is, is very much on the left, uh, citing China as a possible alternative for development. So, you know, just something related to this. Uh, now, uh, let me wrap up with uh, you know, something missing. You know, if you look at the slides, uh, this is a little uh, uh, kind of uh, obsession uh, for uh, panelists. Uh, you know, we, we, we've added one more point and we've deleted, and we add it again, and we delete this, this last point. Um, uh, you know, you may want to be, uh, you don't want to know why, what this is. Uh, it's kind of curious. Let me read this, uh, the last point, uh, which finally is deleted from this slide. Okay, OPA, this has to do with OPA countries. Uh, OPA countries, uh, high trust for China presents some puzzlement. Except the self styled ideological ally of Venezuela to China and Cuba to a lesser, uh, to a less extent, most OBA countries remain diplomatic ties to Taiwan. In fact, the largest cluster of countries was diplomatic recognition of Taiwan. Now, why we delete this? Because, you know, we uh, check on the numbers and figures and, you know, we had different, uh, you know, uh, way of understanding this. Then I checked this again before I came. Yesterday, uh, actually, I counted all the countries, the OPA countries. Now, uh, you know, we all together have about uh, 13 OPA countries, the membership of countries, and, uh, and then the observers. Uh, 15, yeah, all together 15. Out of this 15, seven. Eight, yeah, you know, my colleague uh, correcting me. Uh, out of the 15 OBA membership countries, eight of them now has the diplomatic ties, formal diplomatic relationship embassies in Taiwan. So this is kind of interesting. I know uh, why we want to delete this, partly because the survey does not reflect anything to that nature, because the survey uh, has three countries, OBA countries, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua. Nicaragua, yeah. 
those three plus, you know, Nicaragua now are the countries, all of all about countries that do not have diplomatic ties with Taiwan. Uh, however, this is, uh, you know, somehow really intriguing. Overall, the all about countries, you know, is the Taiwan ally up until now. And, you know, uh, somehow relates to the very beginning of the survey. We have this uh, two flags, Taiwan and China. Don't mix them up. But, you know, somehow those are mixed up. So I don't know. You know, I'm mixed up. I'm, I'm puzzled. I don't know how to explain this. So I stop here. And, uh, and uh, I guess we probably will. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Last but not least, by any stretch, <coughs> the U.S. State Department, Dan Erickson. Great. Uh, well, first, I'd like to begin by thanking the, uh, the Wilson Center and Eric Olson for this invitation, uh, as well as to our fe fellow panelists. Uh, the role of China in Latin America is a subject of great uh, interest for us, and we're always uh, intrigued to see new data, hypotheses, <coughs> Um, that helps to uh, trace out what's happening <coughs> with China in the region. I kind of wanted to divide my comments into two broad categories. The first would be a bit of a policy overview of how we see uh, the role of China in Latin America. And then secondly, I want to, to target some kind of direct comments and questions regarding some of the data that we've seen here today. Uh, just to begin, uh, overall the United States is extremely positive about what's happening in Latin America. Uh, as well as, as uh, regarding our relationship with, with the region. Beginning in 2009, President Obama laid out a framework of partnership um, to really guide our relations with all of the countries of the region. Uh, and we focus in a variety of areas, including democracy and human rights, citizen security, food and energy security, uh, as well as uh, sustainable economic growth and economic integration. Uh, and uh, although we don't have all of the polling data here today, there's a variety of public opinion polls that suggest that this um, set of policies has been extremely well received in the region. We also uh, recognize and applaud the fact that Latin America is playing a larger role on the global stage, uh, and we view a more globally integrated Latin America as good for Latin America and good for U.S. interests in the region. Uh, and clearly, uh, Latin America's relationship with China uh, is a major dimension of that. So just as a broad sta starting point, um, I'd like to underline uh, the fact that the Obama administration views the emerging relationship between China and Latin America in the context of this broader panorama. We seek to have positive, comprehensive, and cooperative relations with China as a major economic partner and key interlocutor on a variety of critical global issues. Um, and at the same time, we recognize that China's growing trade and investment relationship with Latin America and the Caribbean has not occurred in a vacuum, but really also reflects a broader shift in Latin America's global relations as the region seeks to diversify and complement its partnerships with the United States and the European Union with new ties to Asia, the Middle East, uh, and Africa. As some of my previous panelists have underlined, uh, many Latin American and Caribbean countries have had long-standing political and economic ties uh, with Beijing, uh, stretching back to 1960 in the case of Cuba or the early 1970s with many other major Latin American economies. But really the trade and investment relationship has just taken off uh, in the past 10 uh, or 12 years. Um, and we see several interrelated trends as driving uh, the current relationship between China and, and the region. Um, the first and uh, most obvious uh, is that China's robust rate of economic growth has driven it to search for new markets overseas, as well as endowed it with greater resources to cultivate political alliances throughout the world, including Latin America. Secondly, Latin American and Caribbean economies are seeking to diversify their trade partners and take advantage of the new economic opportunities presented by China. Uh, and third, uh, and I'll discuss this a little more at the end, uh, Latin America remains a contested area for diplomatic recognition between China and Taiwan. Um, the, uh, to kind of just, we went over some of the numbers, but I guess I'd like to uh, address them again. Um, China is a, a rising economic power. Its growth rate has been uh, the envy of much of the developing world um, at or near 10% for much of the past decade. Uh, and this has really largely been good news for Latin America. Uh, which is uh, exporting much of wh what China uh, seeks to import 
particularly in the area of um, natural resources and commodities. Um, the pace of trade between China and the region has grown from 10 billion in the year 2000 <coughs> to 240 billion in 2011. Um, this is an impressive figure, although it's still uh, uh, really a, a fraction of total U.S. trade with the region. It's about a third of total U.S. trade with the, the region, and also below what the European Union trades with, with the region. Uh, still, China is now Latin America's third largest trading partner after the U.S. and the EU. Uh, and according to the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, China is actually on track to surpass the European Union and become the region's second largest trading partner by 2015. Now, from a U.S. point of view, a stable and prosperous hemisphere uh, is a core national security interest. Uh, so it's natural that we would follow closely any developments in the region that would affect its success. And that's the optic through which we look at China's engagement in the region. It's clear that the commodity exporting countries of South America have profited in many ways from their burgeoning trade with China, and that this has had a, a positive developmental impact. At the same time, it's worth noting that there's a lively public debate in many countries where manufacturers and others feel disadvantaged by Chinese trade patterns and practices. Uh, this is particularly true in Brazil, Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean. And there are persistent concerns in all of these countries about China's focus on ba basic commodities, uh, the reluctance to open some sectors of its economy to competition from Latin America, and the slow pace of value-added uh, investment. Now, while China's expansion into the region may imply a potential loss for some U.S. business sectors, uh, it's also important to note that trade is not a zero-sum game. To the extent that China's involvement is sparking or can increase economic growth in Latin America, it may contribute to economic stability and well-being in a manner that suits shared U.S. and Latin American interest. In any case, it's, it's up to the Latin American countries themselves to ensure that they are reaping the benefits of China's growth and competing effectively in the global marketplace. Uh, Lastly, uh, I would just like to uh, comment that since 2006, um, the U.S. and China have actually established uh, a standing dialogue on Latin American issues under the framework of the um, strategic and economic dialogue between the U.S. and China. Uh, during the Obama administration, two such meetings have taken place in 2010 and, and 2011. Uh, another one is, um, I'm sorry, it was 2010, 2012. Uh, another one is uh, planned for later this year, and this is really an extremely important forum uh, for the governments of China and Latin America um, to um, exchange uh, ideas about developments in the region, uh, to better explain our respective policies to one another, uh, and to build um, trust moving forward uh, in terms of possible future cooperation. Now, turning to uh, the very interesting uh, set of data uh, that was presented today, uh, there's a, a few comments I'd, I'd like to make. Um, the first is, I think that there's uh, a lot in here that will disappoint the declinists that like to see the U.S. influence in, in Latin America as perpe in perpetual decline and somehow being displaced uh, by China. Uh, while there are some points that were made vis-a-vis -vis public opinion in some of the ALBA states and others, uh, it's clear that, that the United States is still viewed by many publics in the region uh, as, as the, the major factor and the major partner. And secondly, it strikes me that the uh, public opinion of China and Latin America is broadly positive, uh, but also quite fluid and to some degree uh, uh, not well formed. Uh, and, and I'm struck by the fact that uh, China and Taiwan and how you, how you define between the two remains, I think, uh, uh, not very clear to many people in Latin America. Uh, and perhaps, uh, while well, many of you may be familiar about the, the, the tussle over diplomatic recognition between China and Taiwan in the region, it seems to me there's also a bit of a branding issue, uh, that China has not necessarily established a brand that is unique uh, from Taiwan's brand. Uh, and as a result, certain publics uh, tend to perhaps confuse the two. And uh, I appreciate that uh, you tried to address this issue you know, very directly in your study, and I'm sure that the, uh, the results are better for it. Um, the, uh, also, when you br a lot of what I saw, I think, tracks with our understanding of how 
um, China and the relationship with China plays uh, in different countries in, in the region. Uh, it, it really does not surprise me at all that uh, Venezuela, uh, Costa Rica, and Jamaica would be at the top of the list in terms of having more favorable uh, views of China, although for really uh, very different reasons. Venezuela has had a lot of lending in recent years. Uh, Costa Rica recently signed a trade agreement, and, and Jamaica has been a, a target of much attention as part of China's outreach to, to the Caribbean. It also doesn't really surprise me that Mexico would tend to be towards the bottom. Uh, of all of the major economies in Latin America, Mexico is really the one that has, has, had, has had the most trade tensions with China uh, because they compete in some similar sectors and because there's a rather large trade imbalance um, where uh, Mexico uh, buys much more from China than it manages to sell to China. Uh, however, there were some other areas where I had some questions. Uh, Brazil and Chile, for example, which are the two countries where China is, in fact, the number one trading partner in the region, tend to clump somewhere in the middle of the public opinion data. And I thought they would either be at the high end or at the low end in terms of perspectives. Um, and then also Argentina tended to take a slightly dimmer view uh, than Brazil and Chile of, of China, um, despite the fact that Argentina has also benefited uh, enormously from China's role in the region. If there were two... Uh, in addition, if there were two geographic areas where I would really encourage um, uh, Vanderbilt and, and, and the public opinion researchers to, to dive in a little deeper, um, they would be in terms of looking at Central America and then the Mercosur group. Uh, just reviewing the, the data, um, uh, you know, it was hard for me to really understand where does Central America fit? The, although you have a Central American countries have a variety of different um, governments by virtue of ideology, whether they have diplomatic ties with China, levels of economic development, they s seem to be kind of sprinkled across the data, at both the high, low, and, and, and middle ends. And it would be interesting to disaggregate that group and perhaps just do a short brief on Central America and what are the trends that could be identified. Uh, and to, to a lesser degree, the same was true with, with Mercosur where Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, Uruguay, uh, and uh, uh, Venezuela uh, seemed not, I, I had a sense that there was perhaps a coherent story that could be told about that set of countries um, that, uh, that we haven't quite gotten to yet. Uh, and so I think that uh, if I was to encourage kind of further elaboration of the, of the existing data, uh, more information on Central America and more in Mercosur and to see if there's an actual thesis that can be brought out from, from those studies would be interesting. Um, the, I also was struck, and I would ask, uh, on the, the two concepts that were presented in the opinion data, one on, on trust, who do you trust, and second on a role model, uh, how precisely you define that trust, and also um, what sort of definition there might be for a role model. One could conceive as a, a political role model, an economic role model, just simply a role model as a rising developing power. Uh, and so that would be something to, that I'd be more interested in. And then um, a third uh, area, and I'll just con conclude with this, um, is that I think that it would be very interesting if you could pair up uh, with some of the very good economists who are really documenting the trade and investment flows um, of China in Latin America and the Caribbean, and to see if there's any um, correlations that can be teased out in terms of trading patterns, uh, what, you know, large trading patterns, or if you're running a, a deficit or a surplus with China, does that have an impact? Uh, FDI recipients, um, also uh, diplomatic rec recognition, which we touched upon earlier, and. Uh, and in terms of the last set of interesting slides, comparing global powers and how people felt about uh, China uh, versus the United States versus uh, Japan and others, uh, I kind of felt like the European Union was missing uh, in that. And the EU is, is uh, uh, collectively an extremely powerful economic and social force in Latin America. And so I would <coughs> encourage uh, you not to forget or overlook our European partners uh, who, who are also playing a big role in the region. Uh, so those are my comments. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Join me in thanking our panel. Sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite the panelists to just pull up here on the, uh, uh, on the table. Um, we have uh, about a half hour for questions, so if you would be patient. <laughs>
Raise your hand. I'll bring a mic. We'll have a mic to you. Why don't you come up this way, Christine? We have three questions here in the beginning, and we'll m m make our way back. Uh, um, and please, please identify yourself. Remember, we're on uh, webcast here, so we want to be able to hear. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. This may be premature, but it strikes me that the TPP hasn't been mentioned here, and it is really, in many ways, as important a thing for Latin America as it is for Asia. You got Mexico, Chile, Peru, uh, all of NAFTA really going to be pitched into the Pacific, whereas, uh, and now with Japan joining, probably Korea will too, but Brazil and China are not in this and probably not going to be for any time in the future. Is there any way you can project how this is going to start shifting, uh, shifting balances, particularly economic and maybe political? TPP is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, <laughs> Eric, go ahead. Oh, um, 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 my name is Eric Lowe. I'm with the uh, Fair Observer. My, uh, I'm just going to add a, a proscript to uh, Professor Liu is that because I'm the fourth generation of Chinese Latino American in, in this country, and my grandfather was, in, was, the, was the Consul General of Panama in 1946. And my father was also the one who introduced Costco to Panama in the 1980s. So basically, we are <laughs> guilty as charged, you know. <laughs> and my question is that, you know, like, uh, w even, uh, I, you talk about two different models with the U.S. more of a, a direct uh, uh, in, uh, interest in, in Latin America, while China is more of the economic uh, model. Basically, that's the reason why maybe China is more popular, because there's no uh, direct involvement, you know, like maybe military or something like that. Although, uh, in places like Brazil, there's a feeling of like, colonization on the trade with uh, China, because they felt that, you know, that there, there's a holding of resources uh, from China. So um, my question would be, how did you try to uh, rectify this kind of um, uh, belief in uh, uh, kind of uh, latter-day colonization from the, from the Brazilians? Okay, one, one more question here, and then we'll, we'll take another round, so. Okay, my name is Beverly Hong Fincher. Um, as long as we are talking about genealogy, <laughs> <laughs> I'm also not from China, but I'm from Saigon, Vietnam. Okay, but I went to Taiwan, got my first degree, and got my PhD in here, okay, okay in, the, in the States. Anyway, I'm an anthropological social linguist. So my first question is that your data show this flag with not equal to that flag is wrong, absolutely wrong. <laughs> it, I mean, as an anthropological linguist or social linguist, you just do not ask that kind of question to your interviewees. Uh, because everybody, even though I'm not from China, but everybody regards me as Chinese, and therefore I have to keep up with my Chinese <laughs> by coming to here. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but fortunately, I mean, you're very impressive data, really so impressive. I mean, but the, the saving grace is Professor Kang's deleted, deleted uh, slide. From, from your, and I would encourage you to put it back <laughs> in again, <laughs> because that is very important, because <coughs> many years <coughs> ago, before China joined the UN, Taiwan had a big presence in South America already, uh, you know, and mm, as I said earlier, you know, nobody would, would distinguish that, so the data would be fraud. I'm, I'm not saying that it would be completely fraud, Un unless you are, you know, an international studies, whatever, or social science. Uh, otherwise, you come, you come to ask the <coughs> commoner, as I did <coughs> a Navajo. <coughs> I did field work on Navajo. My first publication was on Navajo. Okay. okay. So, so this is. Thank you. My shortcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody care to respond? I just let me just let me just clarify. We didn't ask people to distinguish between. We didn't ask them. You know, 
do you, do you agree that Taiwan is not China? What we found is that because of Taiwan's influence in Central America and the Caribbean, <coughs> when people were talking about China, they were often actually talking about Taiwan. And we wanted to measure opinion toward mainland China, and therefore we introduced the prompt to try to distinguish between the two, to try to urge people to give us their opinion of, of, of mainland China as opposed to the island of Taiwan to the extent that they can distinguish between the two. But to the extent that they can't distinguish between the two, then that's just captured in the data. And we certainly weren't you know, forcing anyone's hand on that. We just asked them to consider mainland um, China. And, the, and the, what the pretesting reveals is exactly that, which is this enormous presence and, um, and interest and knowledge of, of Taiwan in these countries where Taiwan has worked very hard <coughs> to um, push for, 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 for recognition by the governments and also by the, by the <coughs> public in those countries with <coughs> economic um, uh, investments and, and, and projects and, and so on. So I think that, that <coughs> I, I, I think we're actually <coughs> in, in agreement, at least 75%. <laughs> I have a clarification also. Also on that topic, uh, it might be a matter of language. In, uh, in a Spanish, you know, at, uh, usually we don't use in Latin America, Taiwan. You know, the name is usually China. So for both for China and the other China, for all China, you know, the word China is the only one that is known there. So we introduced the term China continental, you know, in a Spanish continental China to try to make this difference in people's minds because a lot of people don't, you know, they, for them, everybody's China. And depends a lot on the level of education. You know, the lower the education, the more likely that are that people don't know that there is actually, you know, two different countries. And the other uh, thing is that, um, you know, I was looking up at the website, uh, the official website of Taiwan, um, and they actually have uh, diplomatic relations with only 12 countries in Latin America at the current time. And they are the five, you know, four of the, Lat of the Central American countries, which are the smaller countries, um, and the Caribbean islands that are really tiny islands. So there is really other, uh, no major country in South America that uh, Taiwan has relations with right now. Uh, one interesting case is a case of uh, Panama, you know, where it still has relations with Taiwan. I mean, with the, but uh, like you said, you know, the, the commercial and everything, and the, the, the opinion of, among Panamanians is very high about continental China, like the China continental. So it, in spite of the fact that they don't have diplomatic, that they have diplomatic relations with, with Taiwan. And um, so it, it does make a difference, you know, it, but in, in many people's minds, they don't just don't, don't even know that there is these two different, um, you know, entities. entities. Um, well, uh, the very fact that uh, Taiwan and the mainland China are kind of mixed up uh, to some degree, it's unimaginable in other parts of the world, except probably the Caribbean uh, states, Central America. Uh, to me, this really suggests, uh, like I said, the lack of understanding uh, and uh, the kind of distance uh, between Latin America and China. Uh, somehow uh, that, uh, in my view, explains, uh, you know, uh, the big puzzle and also, you know, the, this overall uh, data, you know, the, the survey uh, uh, resort that, uh, you know, uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, the Latin American people think that China's uh, growing influence um, is uh, quite obvious. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, how do you understand this influence? Um, to some Latin American countries, uh, especially like Venezuela, uh, it presents a kind of rosy picture. You know, China is great. You know, China is doing wonderfully. Um, even though, you know, ideology doesn't play a role, but I think, you know, uh, uh, somehow the trust uh, in uh, uh, Hugo Chavez uh, uh, speaks volumely, you know, voluminously uh, about uh, you know the, the role that China plays. Uh, now, somehow you know, I find it quite interesting to re uh, uh, react to your question. I'm not quite sure if I get your question about colonization. Uh, yeah, well, uh, Brazilians are not uh, the exception. Uh, if you think about China, if you pull, uh, you know, a larger, uh, a broader perspective, you think, you think about the, the China's role in Africa, uh, there are a lot more uh, complaints, a lot more controversies about China's neocolonialism uh, than in Latin America. Uh, my hunch is this may come to Latin America pretty soon, uh, when China has more engagement with Latin America, more investment, uh, more involvement economically, and socially speaking, uh, so far, I think economic involvement, uh, e economic uh, engagement of China in Latin America uh, remain uh, at 
rather superficial level, despite the fact that they have a lot of uh, already a lot of investments, a lot of trade uh, 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 transactions between China and the Latin American countries. But uh, the, the the degree to which the China had deeply involved in uh, Africa hasn't really uh, come true yet. But uh, my hunch is it will come true. It will, it, it, that day will arrive. Because China, like I said, you know, it's looking for global expansion. You know, it can't not really stop that. So the the issue of colonialism, neo colonialism, uh, inevitably will arise. Uh, one more comment about China's uh, role at this point in Latin American countries is that the China, as a matter of fact, uh, tries very hard to refrain from making uh, more inroads into. Latin American affairs, especially in political, uh, uh, social affairs. Uh, for example, uh, if you remember my slides, I said uh, China's self-styled ideological ally, Venezuela. Uh, I make that uh, in, uh, uh, in intentionally. I said self-styled because it's not reciprocal. China hardly ever acknowledges uh, Chavez-style socialism, and uh, never openly publicly supports uh, uh, Chavez. And uh, in, as a matter of fact, you know, Chinese intellectuals uh, oftentimes are very critical uh, of uh, the uh, left-wing governments, left-wing policies in Latin American countries. Uh, oftentimes, Chavez's radical line presents a kind of embarrassment to the Chinese authorities. So you know that's that somehow explains why China tries very hard to kind of uh, refrain from making any uh, you know inroads into Latin American affairs. Uh, so far, so good. Less is more, I think, uh, compared to China's uh, efforts in any other parts of the world. Uh, not always uh, positive, especially in Asia. China invests a lot of money. Uh, uh, improving its image, image mm, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, counterproductive. Uh, China hasn't really done much in Latin America at all, but uh, you know, uh, hasn't really come that bad yet. You know, so uh, that's why I say uh, less is more. But you know, how long that's going to last? You never know. Mm -hmm. So I stop here. Uh, how about the TPP? Any any thoughts on that? I don't know. It <coughs> came up in the survey, right? You, you, you didn't cover it, right? Uh, yeah, just, I mean, <coughs> briefly, TPP or, or Trans-Pacific Partnership, for those who haven't crossed paths with it yet, is an uh, important trade initiative of this administration, basically to develop a 21st century trade agreement, which includes a set of the United States, a, a set of countries in uh, East Asia, uh, and participation from uh, several countries in this hemisphere. Peru and Chile were part of the founding group, and then Canada and Mexico recently joined uh, negotiations last, last fall. Um, and I think it's too early to see how this is gonna affect public opinion, uh, but it did make me think that another angle uh, on this topic worth exploring is uh, another grouping called the Alliance for the Pacific, uh, which is a group of Latin American countries that are beginning to integrate uh, economically to create a better platform for engaging with China and with Asia as a whole. Uh, and the members of that group are Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile, with Panama and Costa Rica as observers. Uh, so in addition to my previous suggestions on Central America and Mercosur, it might be interesting to look at the Pacific Alliance and see if there's uh, any trends worth noting there. Great, we had a couple more questions here. Margaret, uh, Daly Hayes, Ellen. Um, We'll, we'll work our way back. Keep, yeah, we'll, you'll begin next. Go ahead, Margaret. Hey, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, but I'm, um, I'm, I'm troubled especially by two things. One is, and, and you've mentioned, what do the respondents really know about the, the China's role? And second, what is the the very, what is the current, and I have to be quite current, um, feeling about the, I think, negative news about the relationship. The fact that you know, the shoe industry in Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil, has moved to China. And there's lots of, there's lots of stories about jobs lost, et cetera, because both of imports from 
China, but also kind of the development model. And um, I wonder, do you, do you do focus groups at all around some of these questions so that you might be able to probe how much people know and what their information is about the plus and the minus? Because I can imagine that they are very impressed that China grew for 10% for a decade, but then they forget that it's also having the same kind of difficulties the region is having um, now. Could you pass the mic here, and then, and then we'll take a question back there with Cindy Arnson. Go ahead. Yeah. Great. First, uh, Evan Ellis, Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. First of all, congratulations on the study. Um, I want to point out that uh, this topic, China Latin America, first became vogue in Washington about nine years ago with Hu Jintao's trip to Santiago with the APEC Summit. Since that time, by my count, there have been 11 separate book-length treatments, <coughs> both in English and Spanish, probably <coughs> others in Portuguese from Brazil that I don't know about. Um, of which the 2007 Woodrow Wilson compiled ed edition was one of the first good ones. Uh, literally hundreds of, of econometric studies by IADB, World Bank, others, et cetera. Um, in all that time, this is the first credible attitudinal study that I am aware of presented on, on this topic. So first of all, congratulations. Um, I want to make a quick point to Dr. Liu. I, I think it's very important um, to make a distinction within ALBA between those countries, especially the small Caribbean states, which are net recipients of both Taiwanese and Venezuelan largesse, versus the countries such as Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia, which have a more mature relationship directly with the PRC and largely complementary one. Um, I had just a few quick statistical questions. I, I wanted um, three relationships that I think would be interesting. I wanted to know if there had been any exploration or, or there were plans to. Um, one, as was alluded to by, by, by Dan, um, any correlations between either, either economic complementarity and or levels of industrialization and attitudes, obviously, the, the distinction between Mexico, Brazil, Argentina with very large industrial bases and, and, um, and, and more competitive versus, versus other more complementary. Um, number two, uh, sub-regional correlations, um, as Dan alluded to, um, attitudinal differences between the TPP, I'm sorry, the Pacific Alliance nations and their very different political orientation versus the more heterogeneous uh, collection of nations on the, on the Atlantic. Um, and finally, um, and I think this is probably for future survey questions, um, there was a lot of focus on China as a whole, but um, one of the things we're seeing, especially since 2009, is the impact of Chinese companies and Chinese personnel on the ground, and whether there is any attitudinal data. And I think this actually was hinted at by the, um, by the China-Taiwan point, because um, aside from thinking about China, whether it's PRC or Taiwan, there's also within the region, as you well know, um, a tendency to think about Los Chinos, which is Taiwanese, PRC, Japanese, Vietnamese, et cetera. Okay. Okay. Thank I'm going to let uh, Cynthia Arnson ask a question. Last question here in this round. I, I neglected to mention Cynthia is the director of the Latin America program here at Wilson Center, and and I think the editor of the uh, edited volume that uh, was just mentioned. Hey, thanks, Eric, and thanks to all the panelists. Um, is this on? I think. Yeah, um, it's on. Yeah. My my question, I think, um, uh, is along the lines of uh, some of the comments that Dan Erickson made um, about the interest in having more data. What strikes me about the list of countries and the ranking of countries in which China's influence is viewed most positively is that they are precisely countries where China is not that involved. And so I'm wondering whether there is this confusion, as Evan was just pointed out, and wh which Dinora referred to, where China and, and mainland China and you know PRC and Taiwan are simply confused in people's minds. But you know if you think of that list, apart from Venezuela, Costa Rica, Jamaica, Panama, Nicaragua, Trinidad and Tobago, these are not countries where China has a large role. Whereas you see um, much different sort of attitudes in countries such as Peru, Chile, and Brazil, where China is the number one trading partner. And so I guess having now whetted our appetites, you know, for, for this kind of information, I think it would be really interesting um, to sort of separate out, uh, not necessarily the regional groupings, but rank the order uh, of countries in terms of the actual importance of China in the economy, whether measured in terms of trade or investment, and how attitudes you know, um, are, are related to or correlated to that, um, you know, that kind of 
data about the, impo the actual importance, you know, of China. And the other thing I would also suggest is possibly to break down at a subnational level, and I know that LAPOP does this regularly to, you know, capture the distinctions between urban and rural, but I think that, you know, areas where there are mining investments may perhaps have different attitudes than people, you know, in cities who are benefiting from the commodity boom. And, and you know, the, you just, uh, the headlines almost every day, you know, about social conflicts around mining investments in Latin America, many of them, not all of them, but many of them, you know, Chinese investment that are criticized for being insensitive to the environment and, and uh, to indigenous groups and all these kinds of things. And I'm not singling out China in that regard. I mean, the United States and Canada and other, you know, uh, big investors have a, a very big role <coughs> in that. So anyway, again, thank you for this. And I, and I, I just uh, encourage you to do, to do more and kind of drill down into some of these um, specific questions. Liz, you want to take a crack at some of this and then the others can comment? I'll just briefly respond because the, all those comments were so rich and, and useful and, and, and yet um, also sort of uh, ask us to unpack a lot. Um, <laughs> I mean, and on that last note, let me just say that, yeah, we, we realize that we're just sort of wetting your appetite. And, and one of the things that we want to do is emphasize that these data are publicly available. So if, 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 if you're really teched up, you can work with them in, in you know, a statistical software program, or you can have your research assistant do that for you and, and run some of these analyses. But even if you're not, we um, offer an interactive uh, website off of our, our LawPop website that allows you to go in and pull up cross tabs and means and distributions and, and all that. So, so you really can you know, engage with the, with the data and answer some of these questions. Um, you, you know, you, ca you can also um, sort of get in touch with us and, and we'll try to work with you to, to look more closely at some of these questions. I think the question of what do respondents really know is an important one. And, it, and we didn't do systematic focus groups where we can, you know, analyze that data and report it back to you. But through this process of qualitative and iterative pre-testing where it's, just, you know, it's, it's, it's more of an in-depth interview than a, than a focus group because it's with a single respondent, we did get a sense that there's a lot of sort of lack of information, um, you know, ambivalence, confusing of the, of the, of the two uh, uh, between mainland China and, and, and Taiwan. And I think one of the things that we're seeing then is, and, and, and Dan alluded to this, is, is a very loosely formed set of opinions, right? So one of the things that'll be interesting to see is if we get more structure in those opinions over over time, and then what the nature of that structure is, and 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 what we're you know what you were suggesting is that maybe um, this sort of moderately positive view begins to begins to shift over time toward a toward a more negative as as is investment and relations grow. We just don't know at this point. And so for us, one of the exciting things with the partnership that we've had with with Professor King's team has been to to establish this baseline. And it is a little bit of an amorphous, you know, um, not all that well crystallized baseline, but that. That's, that's just the reality, and so that's that'll be something that we need to watch. Um, one of the things that we can look at with respect to news is um, the relationship between people's attention to the media and their opinions. And and Denora looked at that a little bit, so maybe I'll let her say something about. Well, maybe I'll let you. I will let you. <laughs> 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 or maybe. Um, I, uh, on, on some of e Evan's points, um, uh, first of all, thank you. I mean, w you know, I read your, your writings all the time on this. And when you started saying that there were this many books, I was trying to count up how many were yours. Um, and it's, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're clearly a, an expert on this topic. And so it's great to hear from you on, on this. Um, both you and, and, and Cindy raised the question of can we do more with the data in terms of looking at how it correlates <coughs> with actual levels of FDI and, 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 and other things, and yes, absolutely, and we, and we should do that, and, and again, I guess that goes to this point of, I'd also encourage you guys to do it as well. Um, and the sub-regional uh, thing, not just within, not sub-regions within the Americas, but sub-region within countries is an interesting to, thing to look at, and I did start to do this with respect to Brazil, and you can see attitudinal variation across Brazil. As I mentioned at the very start, the surveys have a large enough number of respondents and a design in terms of how the sample is drawn up that allows you to carve up the country into major geopolitical units. You can't look at, you know, public opinion in a given municipality from our survey and say that's public opinion in that municipality, because they're only going to be about 12 respondents from that municipality, but at the sub-regional level, you know, sort of the north, the south, and so on, you can look at the mean public opinion and you can compare them and you see, you see significant variation. So it is there. Um, 
the the last point I'll make is that this question of Chinese companies, one of the things that we didn't present is in a, a series of questions that asks more about Chinese businesses and the, the presence of companies in the country. And um, and so that's there also for you to, to dig up um, or prod us to dig up. Tenora? Let, let, please let me speak. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, actually, she said everything um, basically. And yeah, one thing I wanted to highlight is that, uh, you know, when you look at the factors or predictors that we call in statistics that, you know, that uh, uh, explain the trust in China. One of them, of course, people that pay more attention to the media are more likely to trust China. So maybe we should do a study what kind of, you know, um, news does the media, you know, uh, point. I think a, a lot of the news are here in the U.S. media about what's the impact of China and maybe never the impact of the mining or something, but to what extent does Latin American media actually focus on those things or just focuses on the positive influence of China? So that might be a factor. And the other one is the, the education level. You know, it was a huge correlation between, you know, higher education and, and trust in China, and knowledge of China. You know, the for us, education is very highly correlated with knowledge of not only China, but also Russia and even Iran and other countries. So because people obviously um, who are uh, who have higher levels of education are more aware of what's going on. They read the news, etc. So this is a major factor. Um, and with regards to all the different correlations that could be done, yeah, I guess there is a, a wide field open for the Duke team here to, to try to do this kind of uh, you know, different groupings of countries, you know, the uh, countries of the, um, um, that, that are part of Mercosur or the countries that are part of other, other groupings within Latin America. I did ALBA, which was a politically group, but uh, the Alliance for the Pacific Countries, you know, does that make a change? And, uh, and certainly, so th there is a lot of potential with this data. This is, I would say, just the beginning. And I just wanted to mention something that uh, Daniel mentioned with regards to the European Union. We did ask about Spain, you know, it was part of the list, but nobody mentioned Spain. Well, I wonder why, you know, with 50%, <laughs> 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 no, 50%, no, that's probably not a role model to follow right now, but uh, it'd be interesting to ask about other European countries. If Either of you want to make a final comment, Professor Liu? Uh, you know, I was just going to say something. Uh, I'm not going to make uh, any final comment. <laughs> it's always risky to yeah. make anything final. Uh, nothing is final. You know, we're going to continue this. So I really, really appreciate, uh, you know, this wonderful uh, recommendations and comments. Uh, you know, we are uh, under uh, financial restraints. You know, we try to ask so many questions, but uh, we cannot really do that, given our budgetary constraints. We'd like to uh, ask more questions, uh, specifically about the, you know, the business uh, activities uh, of Chinese business. We actually uh, uh, have a question specifically uh, for uh, African survey. We actually ask our uh, respondents to identify uh, the categories of uh, business in Africa and uh, uh, even uh, we uh, sort of hint uh, what kind of uh, uh, big names you can identify and Chinese big names, uh, business names, you know, big companies in Africa. Uh, you know, then uh, we ask uh, how they evaluate their performance. So uh, those kind of things, you know, will be very helpful. Um, I think not simply uh, to satisfy the public curiosity, uh, but also with uh, some policy implications uh, for both China and also countries involved. So, you know, I again, you don't want to take this opportunity right. to uh, uh, thank all the audience and also the organizers and, uh, you know, uh, the Wilson. And uh, I'm very, very happy to uh, uh, work with uh, uh, LA Pop, you know, I, I'm sure you know we're, we're going to continue uh, in the future. Uh, we're we're, we're, we're going to have more service. Uh, each survey, you know, will add something more. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, have more funding uh, to ask more questions. So, I will, yes, Dan. Any any last words? Not final words, but <laughs> the. <coughs> the uh, my only comment is I hope that uh, that this group will have a chance to present the findings in Latin America uh -huh. to a Latin American audience. Right. I think it would right. be very interesting uh, to have the discussion. Thank right. you. Okay, let me make a quick announcement. Um, just uh, if you're interested in these topics, on June 19th, there's a Wilson Center-wide conference on the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that brings into our, our program on global economics, uh, Latin America program, the Asia program. It's a, it's a major endeavor. That's on June 19th, and on June 20th, the next day, the Latin America program has a conference on 
Asia, Latin America. So we'll keep coming back to some of these topics uh, going forward. Thank you all very much for your patience. Thanks to our panelists. Is this the first time you've presented this? This is the best. Exactly. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Oh, oh really? Yeah, Here, I'll give you my card. I saw you present. I think you were at the State Department. I'm kind of uh, on another topic, right?